Hey, this is Rod Cleef, and you are listening to the Mailbox Money Show with Bronson Hill. All right, so I'm sure you're probably wondering what's going to happen in 2023, what's going to happen in real estate and multifamily and financing with the Fed, all of those questions, because it dramatically affects your bottom line, your investment, your retirement money, and what you're going to do and how you're going to be able to live. So uh, I have a good friend with me today. I have Neil Bawa, who's an expert. He's known as the mad scientist of multifamily. And I love his approach because he uses a data-focused approach to decide what are the best markets in the country to invest in. He also is really great at looking at uh, what sort of projects he sees and what sort of areas and trends are, are taking place within multifamily. They also use a lot of different uh, virtual assistants and tech within their properties as well as far as the management. So uh, Neil, welcome to the show. Very excited to have you today. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Awesome. So uh, let's let's talk real quick. I wanted to ask you about the mad scientist of. I mean, I, I, I you know I've spent some time with you. You don't seem like that crazy of a you know mad scientist of a guy with beakers. You know, going from side to side. But how did you get that nickname in the first place? Well, it was at a conference, and um, so I was up on stage, and they usually do a, a typical kind of intro for me. And and the presenter was like, you know, he knew me really well, and and so he's like, I'm not doing the regular intro for this guy. And here's what I've seen from him. It's pretty crazy stuff. And you know, I some of it I like, some of it I'm not sure about. Also, the the thing was this conference I think was in Denver and was a a windy day, so my hair was I like literally walked in through the door about you know 15 minutes before they were waiting for me, and and you know how Denver gets when when it's 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 windy and it's cold, and so my hair was just all over the place, right? So it sort of added to it, and he said, you know, I'm I'm just going to introduce him as the mad scientist of multifamily. So I was I was like, what? Me, me mad scientist? So I go up on stage and I do my thing, and and people like it. Then I come down from stage, and then people are talking about it. And then two days later, somebody did a podcast who was at the conference, and they said it. And then first three or four times, I didn't, you know, feel like it 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 was it stuck. But then I really thought about it, and it does because. I have such an, an enormously high rate of experimentation, and I'm willing to expect such a high level of uh, experiments going wrong when it comes to you know various different things. And and some of those are on my Facebook channel. Like you know, I I did an experiment for a year in in growing tomatoes, like six different ways of growing tomatoes, checking out lights, things like that. So I don't, I don't really apply it to only multifamily. I think it's my life. You know, uh, it's life hacking and, and obviously your work is part of that. So over time, I've kind of not only accepted, but like this title of the mad scientist in multifamily. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I was going to say with the hair, I have I don't have the same issue with my hair flying up. <laughs> but I, I can live not on my today. dreams. I, other people it. you. Yeah, <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the question that's on everybody's mind, Neil, is, is 2023 for a lot of people, they're just really confused. They don't know what to do. The confused mind will say, I'm not going to do anything. So Bloomberg had an article, so there was $5 trillion in cash on the sidelines and bank accounts, which is almost five times the amount there was in 2020. So what do you see uh, for 2023, both in multifamily? I know it's area-specific, asset-specific, and you know region-specific. What are, what are some trends that you're seeing? Well, I, we, this is the most bipolar economy that I've ever seen. It's extraordinarily bipolar. Yesterday, unemployment numbers came out. And despite the Fed's uh, insane pounding, I mean, the Fed, Fed is really trying to beat the crap out of the economy. Uh, unemployment went from 3.7, which is amazingly good, to 3.5, a 50-year low, right? So wow. <laughs> you have this economy that simply will not do what the Fed wants it to do. And normally people would be celebrating that. But here we are where anyone that is connected to the real estate market, the stock market, to crypto, you know, all of these markets just simply saying, oh my God, no, unemployment went down, right? And, and so there's this bizarreness where all bad news is good news and all good news is bad news. And I've really never seen anything like this because the Fed's raised interest rates so spectacularly fast. Remember, only once in history has the Fed raised rates at this speed, at this astonishing speed, right? And and so if you, if you look back all the way to 1913, nothing at this speed, this velocity has happened. So we're in completely uncharted waters. And so there's it's very hard to tell what is going to happen simply because the the general economy unemployment is great and no, normally you know people would jump in and say yeah but neil you don't understand unemployment's great but wages are not growing well they are 
wage inflation is actually one of the biggest reasons that the Fed continues to pound because wage inflation right now in the US is very high. It's about 5%. And you know, the Fed wants that to be about 2% to match inflation rates. So we can't even say people are not getting raises. They are, they are employed, they are getting raises. Household balance sheets are still in a good place, though they're not as good as they were a year ago. And so we're in this strange time frame. But on the other side, stocks are down, NASDAQ's down 33%, S&P 500 is down 25%, uh, sorry, 20%, all corporate pro profits are down 30%, right? And, and so you look at that, household wealth, which is something I really care about more than the NASDAQ and the S&P 500, is down $13.5 trillion, right, since the, in, in 2022. So you've got this weird dichotomy that we are living in that we're all trying to understand. We can get into the details of what that means for single family and multifamily, but we've seen, you know, multifamily prices haven't gone down, but when you adjust for cap rate, they've definitely gone down. They've gone down somewhere between eight and 12%. It may not be obvious to to you know bystanders because they, they might see a higher number for a property, but they don't understand that its NOI is actually higher, and right. so it should have been sold for more. Um, whereas single family prices were definitely seeing a decline across the board in the U.S. Almost every single market in the U.S. is negative, with with the 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 worst performing market in the U.S. quarterly and already down 10.6 percent. So we're seeing that impact, this massive impact, and what it appears is that in this extremely weird time the Fed's action and the interest rate hikes that they're making are having a different level of effect on each, each market. So the single family housing market, uh, multifamily has been significantly affected, but so far payroll in the US doesn't appear to be affected. Services employment doesn't appear to be affected. So we have to kind of read the tea leaves here in a way that's a bit harder and to me a little more, bit more fun than before, yeah, right? Because there's there's two different directions in which things could go here. And to me, the most important date for the economy, just so everyone knows, is the 31st of January. So we'll talk more about that. Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting. You brought up some, real, uh, some great points about uh, it, it's not always clear, you know, how things are doing or what's happening. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also a lot of why a lot of people get intimidated is they don't really know. They hear different things and, you know, this number's up, this number's down. Of course, even in multifamily, like rents are up, but valuations are down. So then maybe they offset. And then you've got, of course, just all the inflation that's happening and the money creation of the last few years. So, yeah. So talk to us um, then. Yeah. You could lead into January 31st. So what, uh, what, what what's happening there? Well, I think January, January 31st is really the most important Federal Reserve meeting of 2023 because what the Fed's done is, you know, it's four times these 75 basis point or 0.75 point hikes. These are massive hikes, by the way. They're humongous. Even one of them rattles Wall Street. But when you have four of them in five months, Wall Street basically is like, you know, what the heck is going on? But then they got some good news in December where, you know, it wasn't a 75 basis point hike. It was 50. Right. And right. so now we're, we're beginning to see some, even though we're still seeing extremely strong, um, you know, uh, you know, hiring 233,000 people in any given month would be considered great. But after nine consecutive months of pounding is just an astonishingly good number. But then on the other hand, we are seeing. Um, very, very significant decreases in inflation across the board. So we're, we're seeing uh, goods inflation come down. So, you know, food inflation's down, oil inflation's down. Uh, so are uh, a bunch of raw materials. Um, I, the, I track some really, you know, let's go back to the mad scientist piece, right? So I track a bunch of shipping container websites because I find that they give me a, an enormous amount of data on where's the demand happening and where's the, the, the supply, you know, bottlenecks. And I can tell you that for the uh, eastern part of the United States, uh, we are within 10% of shipping container costs when compared to pre-COVID. And we were at double that number 12 months ago, wow. right? So we were double pre-COVID. That's insane amount of inflation. Now we're within 10%. For the western part of the United States, we are now at the pre-COVID number. A shipping container from China to the West Coast of the United States cost the same as it did before COVID. So all of that inflation went up, went down, it's evened out, right? And so the goods inflation has come down spectacularly and the Fed's gotta be looking at that. The only thing that really could be stopping them at this point is, is the wage inflation, which really hasn't moderated. But keep in mind that the Fed also understands that if everything else falls at some point, employers just don't have to pay people anymore uh, if overall inflation's down, right? What's, the, what's the, the reason to pay people more if inflation's down? So the key date 
the key date that every single person that wants to be in this business and understands this business should be looking at is January 31st because the, the, there's a question for the Fed and that is, do you raise rates by a quarter point, which signals a continuing decline in the aggressiveness of their rate hikes? Or do you stick with 50? Because if you stick with 50, that could be the new plateau for a while. So you could raise, do another 50 in March and then you could do another 50 in May, right? And so 50 is really bad news. It will rattle the market. It will uh, it will basically not unfreeze the, the single family market and the multifamily market. And I'm going to give you in a moment, I'll tell you what I mean by unfreeze. Markets are frozen. Lending's frozen, multifamily's frozen, real, and, and single family's frozen. So, the, but if you hit 25 basis points, I think you're going to see a very significant and immediate unfreezing of all kinds of markets. So to, to understand what I mean by that, let's talk about what freezing means, right? So multifamily lending in the United States is down 78% year over year. And that's a spectacular wow, number. Usually 10% would, would scare the shit out of us, right? 78% decline in multifamily lending. Now on the, on the real estate side, we're seeing spectacular decreases in the number of units coming to market for sale because people think they're not going to get the, the pricing, so they're just holding off. So sales volumes for single family in the United States are dropping catastrophically, like very, very large numbers. Some markets are down as much as 75% in terms of sales volume. Now, what's nice is prices are still okay. So there is not a lot of panic in the market. There's this wait and watch attitude, right? So for on the, on the single family market side, there's a bunch of markets that have seen declines. Uh, Coeur d'Alene, which is a very small market in Idaho, being at 10.6% or 10.8%. Then Austin being at 10.6%. Austin's you know normal because it went up the most. So there's a retrenchment there, nothing to panic about. Um, and then there's uh, San Jose, which is obviously Silicon Valley at 10.4%. And then there's a bunch of markets at 7 or 8%, 6%, Phoenix, so on and so forth. So a lot of the bubbly markets are seeing single family price declines in the single uh, digit category. And then on the multifamily side, adjusted for, for uh, you know, uh, rents, we are seeing somewhere between an 8 to a 12% drop. Uh, some markets seeing as much as 15%. Depends on what kind of asset it is. All of a sudden, nobody wants to pay three cap or four cap on actual four class C properties. So those have gone into the fives, whereas class A properties have not moved as much because what had really happened was they were pretty much where they were. And then the class C's went from, you know, six cap to five cap to four cap to three cap. Yeah. And now they're retrenching back towards the, the five cap, you know, area. So it, it really depends on the, on the property type. So I, I think at this point, there's only one game in town and it's called the Federal Reserve. All lending is pretty much frozen. I mean, nobody yeah. is lending 75% yeah. loan to value on a fully stabilized, yeah. fully performing property. And that makes no sense because our entire business model is predicated on us getting the property, a good property to the point where it's fully stabilized and being able to basically get it to 75% LTV. And no one is willing to give us that kind of money at this point in time. It, you know, the, the numbers are either 70% LTV, if you're really lucky, or 65, or 60, or 55, or even 50, yeah. Yeah. right? So, I mean, th these are stunning numbers and almost hard to comprehend how difficult that makes it to, for us to run our business. But, here, but here's the silver lining. Fundamentally, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the economy. Yeah, nothing yeah. at all. Yeah, it, it, you brought up you know a lot of really good points, but yeah, you're right. Lending has just stopped, and it's just it doesn't make sense. These deals don't pencil. I mean, whether it's single family, it's multifamily, and so I, I felt similar to you is that once lending starts to stabilize, meaning the rates, the rate hikes, even now it's just, there's so much uncertainty. Are they going to keep raising? What they're saying is they're going to keep raising for the next year at least and more. And it's, it's like, you know, I think historically from the time of the first rate hike to the time they start cutting, the longest they've ever done it is 13 months. And that would be because they started raising March of 2020, it would be April of 2023, but this may be longer. So we don't know. And so that's, I think the uncertainty of it to be able to um, so, so, I mean, what's your gut saying? Do you think that it is going to be a lower, kind of like a tapering type of lower hike or what's your gut kind of saying if you were to make a prediction? Um, it's very hard, but I'll say that the, the early data that I'm seeing for January uh, points to inflation continuing to moderate. Uh, so the Fed may choose to go with the 25 basis point, and I hope that they will. 
Uh, but there's, it seems like the Fed itself is split. The, the doves and the hawks are at this point split. So far, that hasn't happened. The Fed's been very united. Everyone's saying we need to hike, we need to hike fast. So now we're beginning to get two distinct camps that I think are going to battle each other for whether we want to do a 50 point hike or a 25 point hike. Because so far, the Fed believed they weren't damaging the economy. Everyone else disagreed with them. Everyone else was wrong. The Fed didn't damage the economy. How is it possible that in December, not the best month for payroll, we have a quarter million brand new jobs created if, the, if we're damaging the economy? So the Fed was right. Everyone else was wrong. All these people writing stuff saying we are going to break something in the world economy or break something in the US economy didn't happen, right? So, so far, they've been very united. And now I'm beginning to see two completely different groups. And I hope that the group that has the 25 basis point, um, you know, uh, kind of push is the one that ends up winning on, on January 31st. So uh, never in our history, never in US history, has what the Fed wants to do in a single meeting mattered so much for any and every kind of business? Never. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a unique time. You really can't go back to history and look at any specific time that this was happening, what's happening now. Um, so obviously January 31st is a big, uh, you know, obviously a big thing to see. Um, I know you're doing stuff in the, I want you to talk about build to rent because I know you're doing quite a bit there. Um, talk about, you know, I guess, cause there's almost like a sliding door moment here, right? Like if things continue to, you know, stay, they, they keep being more hawkish and, and trying to, you know, raise rates more effectively versus dovish. Like that's kind of a different route. How does that change your view as a passive investor? Is it like, am I, is, do you think it's wise to just be holding cash and waiting kind of the wait and see model? Or is it, are you trying to, as an investor deploy as much as you can? Like what, what are some different approaches when it comes to this? Well, I'll answer that in one sentence. I just wrote a deck, it's 17 slides, for my existing investors called the benefits of waiting, right? So I think yeah. it, it's, it kind of lays out the case that this is the only time that I've ever seen in history that waiting for three quarters is more profitable than making investments, right? So that's that's our belief. So. Uh, we're certainly going to wait for a quarter and we might wait for a second quarter and we might also wait for a third which i think is going to be an outlier so some really spectacular things have to happen for us to wait for three quarters we're certainly waiting for the first quarter to see what what the fed does so that you know that's that's my mindset now going back to your original question right so i'm i'm heavily invested into a brand new asset class which I started investing back in 2017, uh, and now it is the hottest, by far, the hottest part of um, of real estate. So if you look at commercial real estate, the least hot part of commercial real estate is office. So any kind of office in the US because of work from home, they're in extraordinary and severe distress. Um, and then you look at, okay, what's the hottest part of, you know, of real estate? And some people would say that's multi, still multifamily. Some people would say it's industrial real estate. I don't think that there's any other candidates at this point. But then the question is, well, what about multifamily is a big bucket. What, what inside it is hottest? What's attracting the most amount of equity? By far, the, the biggest attraction of equity or institutional or smart money equity in multifamily today is built to rent. And it's, it, everything has to do with inflation and home price increases. So, you know, my I have a core belief, and we don't see this a lot at multifamily conferences. My core belief is this, our growth, our future, our returns to our investors in multifamily, in apartments, are very heavily dependent on us, our understanding of the single family market. Single family is a much larger market in the US. There's a lot more units built every year. There's a lot more units sold every year. And the single family market has knock on effects on the multifamily market and actually provides us with the only crystal ball I've ever seen. So it, uh, things happening on the multi, in the single family market have pretty good prediction levels of what will happen 18 months later, sometimes 12 months later in the multifamily market. So you sort of have a crystal ball there, which is very nice because you, you, you know what's happening on the single family side. For example, um, any market that sees a massive and sudden increase in home prices is likely to see a massive and sudden increase in rent prices a year later.
Why not immediately? Well, that's because you know rents are locked in for a year, so it, the, the effect is not immediate. It, you have to suck a bunch of homes out of the market. You have to increase prices before that effect takes place. So there's this delayed effect, and usually it's 18 months. Recently, it's been more 12 months because everything's been so smooshed together. Um, and so when I'm looking, what are the big trends? What are the step back to the 35,000 foot level bronze and saying what really matters and how does it affect apartments? Right. So here's my biggest feedback. Single family homes in the US were becoming unreasonably priced over time, but still two thirds of Americans or close 62 percent of Americans lived in a single family home. Right. So only the remaining 38 percent lived in some kind of apartment or they lived in grandma's garage. Right. So most Americans lived in single family homes. And the prediction was that now that the millennials are in their peak earning years, so that they've kind of matured as a generation, they would also move towards home ownership. And I think to some extent they would have. But then COVID happened. And then we had the most extraordinary increase in home prices in history, right? Wow. Nothing, 2001, uh, you know, nothing, uh, 1999, nothing has ever come close to this. So, all of a sudden, we end up in this bizarre situation. You know, you, what happens over time is, you know, uh, home prices go up, rents go up. So there's this catch up effect that happens. Eventually, uh, uh, you know, uh, earning home or sorry, um, paying for homes, your, your monthly mortgage ends up more or less being close to what the rent should be. Rents tend to be a little bit less, and that's very common. But this is the first time where in the last 12 months, the gap between rents in the US and owning a home price became absurd, simply absurd. So now we have, for the first time, and and uh, you know this is this is a podcast, so I can't show you the the actual graphic of this, but here's what it looks like. So this is uh, this is rents, right? And they're increasing, and this is home prices, right. like that, right? This is this is what's happened in the last 12, 12 months. Now. I'm assuming that there will be a retrenchment of home prices of about 10, 11% in the US, right? So some markets may be 15, some markets might be five. After the retrenchment, it will be the most absurd gap between rent prices and home prices in history. Now, doesn't this mean, isn't this good news for all forms of multifamily? Sure it is, sure it is. But the, the group that is the most affected were the people that actually earn good money in all the markets in the US and were going to buy homes that now their chances of buying homes are almost zero. Now these people do not, if they're not able to buy a home, they are not going to go live in a class C apartment. They're not going to even live in a class B apartment, which is why with the exception of the last four months, class A rent growth in the United States has been spectacular. Class C has been good. Now, that is a reverse. It's flipped around because from 2013 to 20, just before COVID, Class C rent growth was the highest. It was the apart, the cheaper apartments that were seeing the highest rent growth. And Class A was sort of, it was good. You know, they, they, were, they were pretty happy, but it was never as good as the, the cheaper apartments. Now we've seen a situation flip around because a whole bunch of people, and we're talking about potentially 6 million families, that we're buying homes simply are not close, even after 10% price reduction. So the opportunity that institutional America is seeing today, and it, this there's a, a thousand research papers about this, by the way, on the web, just look. The SFR or single family uh, rental institutional market is the hottest thing it's ever been. $75 billion has already been raised. And this is before leverage, before adding loans, because you could probably make it $200 million, $200 billion after you add lending. And these people, initially, they were like, I'm just going to raise $2 billion and buy 2,000 single family homes and rent them out. And they realized there's nothing available in the market for rent. Today, inventory of single family rental homes in the US is the lowest in history, simply because nobody wants to put their home on the market because they know that because of interest rate issues, they're, they're going to have to take a discount. So nobody's, there's nothing on the market. So no institutional buyer can buy anything. So what do they do? They have two options. They can go to people like me that are building what is known as build to rent, build to rent communities. And these are not 
apartments. We're not building apartments. We're building basically single family homes, single family, single family, single family, but smaller. Not the usual Texas 2,400 square foot single family home, but 1,200 square feet, 1,300 square feet, little backyard, little front yard. So the, the, because obviously if you build a 2,400 square foot, it has the same exact problem that people can't afford it. So there's no point in building those, but now we're building smaller. This is new. This is different. And now we build 200 of them together and we attach a beautiful clubhouse, pools, gyms, CrossFit, all of those things that you never get with a single family home. So the question is, and this is the question that's now beginning to be answered is, will people in America who cannot afford a single family home say, I just want this single family 1200 square foot home because I love all the amazing amenities in this gated community, right? And $75 billion of institutional capital has been poured into finding out the answer to this question. So far, we've built a small number of these special kind of built to rent you know, properties. And the absorption rates have been stunning. The rents have been stunning. And most important, and this is for industry professional that listen to Bronson's show, the retention rates, the people renewing, have been mind boggling. No one leaves. And we all know retention is all the profit in multifamily. Well, I want to make a comment about that because so for me, I, you know, a little bit of my story, I live in Los Angeles and Pasadena and I, we have our 200 million in multifamily that's in the Southeast and it hasn't made sense to buy a home here. It just, it's like to buy a home, the home that I live in, I actually rent because it makes more sense. It's like, it's a $1.2 million house. The rent is 3,500 a month, but to buy it, I'd have to put down you know, 10% or 10.0%, whatever that'd be, it would be between probably eight and 10 K a month just for the payment. So we got this thing where, you know, rent is a third, you know, half to a third of what it would be to buy. So it doesn't make any sense. Right. And so it's just an, a very interesting market. And you brought up a lot of, you talked for a while about the trends and what's happening. We've never had this, you know, the housing prices went crazy. So I guess the, the question is on that too, is will rents continue to rise to catch up or will it be you know, maybe, uh, you know, to, to kind of get back to historic numbers or do the prices, maybe like you said, comes down 10, 15% in some markets. And then you also have maybe rents start to come up a little bit more over time, but it's, it's a very interesting housing market right now. It is. So, so let's get predictive, right? So let, let's, let's now talk about, you know, what happens in the future. We've kind of caught everybody up, right? So right. I, if you would assume that if the monthly payment for a new purchase is 57% more, than the average apartment rent, then rents would keep rising very quickly, right? Even right. if even if home prices are coming down a little bit. So, but I'm not predicting that to happen. And as far as I know, no one else is predicting that to happen. And I'll tell you why. Okay. So we are expecting that rents are going to rise in 2023. But especially because inflation at this point still is at six or seven percent. So if real inflation is at six or seven percent, you expect rents to rise. You don't expect them to plateau or go down. But what we don't expect rents to do is to catch up that gap between your yeah. mortgage payment and your your rent payment right now is massive. And so you'd expect that there would be a quick catch up, but we don't think that that's going to happen. And I will tell you why, because of a technical term called household formation. So mm -hmm. household formation in the United States is what drives rents and it drives occupancy. So when household formation in the US is very strong, uh, occupancy in the U.S. for apartments goes from 94 percent to 95 to 96. Even more at 97, uh, like a year and a half ago, right? Briefly, and then when household formation stalls, you actually see occupancy going downward. So we've gone from you know 97 percent to 96 to 95. Historically, we're at 95.4 percent as of you know this month. Historically, 95.4 percent is a pretty amazing number, right? Mo most people will be like, yeah, 95 percent. But in the context of the fact that it was 97% 15 months ago, and it's coming downwards, and it continues to come down every month, yeah. Yeah. that indicates weak household formation. And what we have not seen in US history is weak household formation and strong rent growth at the same time. In fact, rent growth right now in the United States is almost uniformly negative. There's a few places like Indianapolis that are going up, but it's it's negative. now. That's not unusual. Rent growth in November and December is usually negative in almost every year, with the exception of 2021. That was just a batshit crazy year. So nothing that happened in 2021 should ever be used as an example 
going forward because that was just nuts. <laughs> but what we've really seen, Bronson, is 2023's household formation may have gotten pulled forward to 2022. So we saw some absurd numbers in 2022. We saw the largest increase in rents in history. We saw the largest increase in home prices in history. And, and so some of that got pulled forward. So I believe, a lot of people believe, this is the year of moderation. You might see rent growth in some markets be as high as 5%, in some markets be as low as 2%, except the San Francisco Bay Area, which is just going to get slaughtered. So, so I think that you're going to see that moderate level, 2 to 5%, depending upon your metro. The metros that see very large home price drops, so I'll pick... I'll nitpick and I'll say Austin's Phoenix are two that because they went up so much are probably going to see 15% home price drops. Well, those might be at the bottom of that. They might be 2% rent growth, right? But the ones that actually didn't see as much of a home price drop because they didn't see as much of an increase are ironically the markets that I don't like. Rust Belt markets like Cincinnati, uh, markets like Indianapolis. Currently, Indianapolis has the highest rent growth in the US as of January 9th, you know, 2003. 23. And it's typically not a leader market. You typically don't see it in a top 10, top 20 list. You don't see Cincinnati in there. These are, you know, kind of older Ohio markets. They're there because they didn't go up like crazy for home prices. They didn't go up crazy for, you know, rents. So they are benefiting from the fact that inflation is high so they can raise rents. So they don't have this pull down right. effect that we're seeing in a lot of the other markets. So, so I, I believe you're, you're about to see rents go up about three or 4%. Now, what about prices? Well, multi single family unquestionably has to drop. It has to drop. It was insane. I'm not even calling it a drop. I'm calling it a nationwide retrenchment. You know, retrenchment happens when you just go shoot up like crazy, you gotta come down a bit. So somewhere between eight and 12%, and again, you know, superstar markets like, you know, San Jose or, or Phoenix or Austin might be more like 15%. And then Rust Belt markets might be more like eight. So home price drops, continues to drop there. Um, and then multifamily pricing, very heavily dependent on the Fed because of what you said at the very beginning of this podcast, you said there is $5 trillion of dry powder sitting in there. Because of the debacle in office, the meltdown in office, most of that money wants to go into multifamily, but they're not dumb enough to put any money in right now. They're just patient capital, institutional investors. They're just sitting on the sidelines and they will sit on the sidelines until it makes sense. So it's all dependent on the Fed where multifamily prices go. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's a great. The Fed is really driving everything, particularly in multifamily. I really appreciate your insight on the single family stuff as well. Um, I have two more questions for you, and then we have to kind of wrap up. But what other, besides real estate, I know you're a real estate, you are the mad scientist of multifamily, but besides real estate, what are there anything else that you like investing in just personally outside of real estate? I always try to ask this question because as an investor, you're looking at, okay, real estate right now, what are some things in the next three to six months that are outside of real estate? I know you have some other assets you work with as well. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I I love real estate and I will keep doing real estate, but I think that the, the best opportunities for the last 10 years were in real estate. I think you would very much agree with me on that. But I don't think that the greatest opportunities in the next 10 years or next five years are in real estate. I think they're outside real estate. I think, I think that almost every superstar opportunity in the world today is either tied to commodities, to reindustrialization, or deglobalization. And these are all sort of themes that are somehow connected together. And obviously there are real estate, you know, uh, offshoots of these that you can, you can look at again. So the, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that China is at peak. China is, you know, because of its horrendously awful demographics, they have way more old people than, than, than young people is at its peak. This is the peak of China. They might still get become a bigger economy, but they're going to slow down extremely radically. We're seeing that already. And so what's happening is that there's reshoring happening for political reasons, for, for you know geopolitical reasons, where we're not sure if they're going to attack Taiwan next. We saw what Russia did with the Ukraine and how it, it, it had is incredible energy effects across the world. Now we're a little bit wiser. And so we are seeing companies like Apple basically go to Foxconn and say, if you keep building phones in China, we will basically just open shop in India. So Foxconn says, how about we move 25% of iPhone production to India? Will you let us do that? And Apple's like, sure. And so Foxconn goes to Bangalore, opens up, basically hires everyone in Bangalore that they can find 
right? And yeah. says, oh, we will just hire a quarter million people and move 25% of production. And then TSMC, which is the largest and most important chip manufacturer in the world, realizes that all of their eggs are in Taiwan, an island that's 100 miles from China. And so TSMC goes to Phoenix and basically builds a $12 billion plant. And 12 billion sounds like a lot. We play it up a lot, but it's, it's a very small number, right? In the, in the chip manufacturing industry, it's, it's nice, but it's not huge, right? So they did that and it was basically a publicity stunt saying we're doing something in the US. Then five months later, the Chinese launch an exercise, an invasion exercise on the island, and they up that number from 20 to 40 billion, right? <laughs> and the moment yeah. they did that, now a very significant portion of chip manufacturing is returning to the United States. So there's wow. this reshoring happening. More of it is happening to Mexico and, and the headlines are all in the US. So I think most opportunities are limited, are, are related to the fact that we are now going to run out of core, com you know, uh, core um, commodities. So we're certainly running out of lithium, which is used to make batteries. And then there's real estate opportunities tied to that. Has anyone asked this question, where, where are the rare metals in the United States? These are the places that used to be, you know, lots of people used to work there. Now they were abandoned 30 years ago because it made no sense to, to run those mines. And now every one of those mines is being reopened. And I don't think people really understand how big a deal this is. There's, we, we need to return roughly a trillion dollars a year of industrial to the US and roughly three to four trillion dollars a year to Mexico, India and Vietnam. Right. So and even, and the Mexico one is definitely tried to the southern part of the US. So the biggest tip that I would have to give would give you is this. Look at the roads that connect the powerhouse manufacturing portions of Mexico to the United States. They're running through New Mexico, Texas, maybe a little bit Florida, but really a lot of Texas. Look at these roads. Look at where they're going. Look at which cities they're stopping in the industrial powerhouses. That is where the Americans are going to invest in because they want to now be close to Mexico. For a long time, you don't have to be close to China. You got on a plane to China. But with Mexico, it almost everything is going to come over land. There's only, what, five freeways? So it's very easy to tell which areas are going to benefit. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, and, and talking, looking at trends, I ask, I always ask everybody this question. I asked Ken McElroy this question. He said, well, look at the trends. Well, look at what's happening. And you're a data guy, a numbers guy. So much respect for what you're doing, Neil. And I just want to celebrate, just encourage everybody to check out your stuff because you have a lot. You offer the real estate community. You've got a great operation and all different types of assets. I know you had some private equity stuff you were doing as well, which is awesome in the tech space. So how can people get in touch with you if they want to reach out, you know? Well, given we are doing this in January, I, I think the best way is to go to multifamily university. So you can just type in the words multifamily university and then my name, Neil Bao. I'm the only Neil Bao on the World Wide Web or just type in my name. Um, on the 25th, I'm doing real estate trends, which is basically the hour long with charts and graphs version of what we talked about today. And then in February, I'm doing a presentation that's very near and dear to me, which is mega trends, the top five trends for the next 10 years that are not real estate trends, but with tips on what the real estate benefits of those are. I'm sure, you know, we've already talked about, um, you know, reshoring as being and, and reindustrialization being one of those uh, mega trends. But I think Jan and Feb is a great time to come to those presentations. I think most people in our ecosystem stay there for years without investing and we're okay with that. Um, so I think the best way to get into the ecosystem is just check out our presentations on at Multifamily University. And I've watched some of your presentations. They really are phenomenal. So I appreciate you, Neil, all the value you're adding to the space. Uh, thanks for being here today. I know we have an event coming up as well. See you at some yeah. future events. Appreciate you being with our group today. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, so you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. You've been hanging out with Bronson Hill and Neil Bawa. And I love Neil because he just is so into data, right? I mean, you just hear he's got these data, 10.8% this, 12%, whatever. And the data really is important because uh, people that are on the front of trends, they can tell where things are going and you can find patterns, right? Tony Robbins talks about pattern recognition. Once you uh, can identify certain patterns, you can really take advantage of them, whether that's interpersonally or that comes to economics or investing. And so Neil's, Neil's opinion is really, this is a good time to wait. Uh, my opinion is, you know, to be to be as deployed as I can. So what's right? You know, I think it depends on your situation, depends on what you're looking at. 
Um, I think multifamily, like, I mean, we both have kind of the same long-term conclusion that a lot of money at some point will really flood into multifamily. So I, I just don't want to be last, right? I'd rather be first, be a little early, be there, be in a great asset and know that there's incredible demand there and know that some of the financial stuff will get figured out. So um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed this interview. Uh, if you haven't reviewed this podcast or left a comment on this show, if you're watching it on YouTube, please leave a comment, uh, write a review. It really helps us to uh, get better guests and continue to uh, reach more people with this show. So thanks again for taking the time to educate yourself. You've been listening to the Mailbox Money Show with Bronson Hill. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode. You've been listening to the Mailbox Money Podcast. For more free resources, articles, and videos, go to bronsonequity.com. There you can download your copy of the special report, The Single Best Investment Strategy During and After a Pandemic. None of the information shared here is an offer to buy a specific investment, and this is for educational purposes only. Consult your financial, legal, and tax professionals and use your own common sense before making any investment decisions. Thanks for joining us, and be sure to tune in next time for more Mailbox Money.